Welcome to episode 62 of Kowalski Analysis. I'm your host, Rob Kowalski. This is a podcast designed to help you navigate the weight and become the best version of you. Before we get into who tonight's guest is and I introduce him, I just quickly want to go ahead and announce a winner from the competition that we did on the last podcast with Mitchell Eason. And actually, before we do that, go ahead and drop a comment. Let me know that you're here. Say hi, say hey, say hello. If it's your first time uh, tuning into one of these, go ahead and let me know where you're watching from. I always like to know where the new people are coming in from. And hey, feel free to share this out. This guy that I have on tonight is all about helping you find your purpose and become the person that can actually attain that purpose. So it's going to be a very important conversation. But before I introduce who that is, I want to go ahead and do a quick giveaway for the competition that we did on the last podcast with Mitchell Eason. We're giving away a ticket to Charm City Countdown, the New Year's Eve party that I throw every year here in Baltimore, Maryland. It's the biggest and best New Year's Eve party in the city. And uh, we're giving away a VIP ticket to one person that commented on the last podcast. Virginity Rocks was the comment that I asked uh, everyone to leave. And the person that we picked is named Carolyn Boker, or I'm not sure if it's Becker, but it's spelled B-O-E-K-E-R, <laughs> Carolyn Boker. Okay, you have 24 hours to send me a private message for instructions on how to go ahead and claim that ticket to Charm City Countdown. If you'd like to attend this event where city fan people are going to be flying in from all over the country to attend, you can go to charmcitycountdown.com to find out more information. And we're going to be doing another giveaway of another VIP ticket at the end of the show. So stay tuned till the end for instructions how to win. But again, leave me a comment. Let me know that you're here. Feel free to share this out. And Carolyn Boker, you are the winner of the, uh, the ticket. All right, let's get into it. Tonight's guest is Joseph Wilson, and he's a radical Jesus-loving entrepreneur and a coach to world changers. Joseph's mission in life is to mobilize people into their purpose, and he believes that the solution to all the world's problems lies in the divine design of each unique individual, and Joseph's life's calling is coaching people to become their person their dream requires. He resides in New Zealand, is happily married to his wife, Kirsten, and together they have three children. Before I go ahead and bring him in, let me quickly mention my sponsors. I want to give a shout out to Micah Hughes. He helps people achieve financial peace through real estate investing. So whether you want to buy, sell, or invest, Michael will come alongside you and walk you through the entire process. You can let him know I sent you. Give him a call at 443-532-8450 or email him at micahughes at mundalconsulting.com. My next sponsor is Advisors Mortgage, and they have a highly competitive structure that's coupled with their state-of-the-art technology makes them second to none in their commitment to guiding you through the home buying or refinancing process. Actually, Advisors Mortgage and Micah work well together, so they can help you all the way from A to Z if you're wanting to buy, sell, or invest. But Advisors Mortgage offers all finance types as well as close on time guarantee. You can call Adrian White directly at 610-999-3448 or visit his website at awhite.advisorsmortgage.com. All right. With no further ado, let's bring in Joseph Wilson. There's the man. Hello. Welcome to Kowalski Analysis. What's up, Joseph? And what's up? Thank you so much for having me on, man. Very excited. Yeah. What time is it over there? Is it like early in the morning? Well, it's 10 past nine, so not too early. 10 past nine a.m.? A.m., yep. Okay, so you guys are, whatever that is, 17 hours ahead of us. Yeah, I like to say I am seven hours behind you, one day ahead. Easier way to do the math. Okay, there you go. But it's uh, Wednesday over there, right? It's Wednesday. So yeah, you are ahead. You're ahead. And New Zealand, right? That's where you're at. New Zealand, correct? Auckland, New Zealand. Oh, off. Yeah, I've never. I've I never wanted to visit New Zealand as a kid, but I, I hear such good things about it now. They said it's like Australia, but without all the like the insects and the and the like the things <laughs> that will kill you. Yeah, that's right. It's paradise, man, really. It's actually paradise, like no snakes and uh, a lot of the insects are not here. Beautiful scenery everywhere you go. I'm 30 or 40 minutes away from a beach on either side of me. Amazing place. Not many. Yeah, there are a few here and there, but not many. Not like Australia. Australia has a lot more shame. Right. That's wild. Isn't that where Lord of the Rings was filmed in New Zealand? Yeah, put us on the map. Cool. Mm. All right, so before we get into the conversation, we'd like to do a little segment called This or That. And I'll just ask you five this or that questions and just have you answer them in rapid succession. You ready? Oh, wow. Okay. All right. You ready? Early riser or night owl? Early riser. Okay. Detail or big picture? Big picture. 
Okay. Disney World or Island Vacation? Island Vacation. Formal or casual? Formal. Okay. Washing the dishes or mowing the lawn? Dishes. <laughs> really? Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. That just gives us a little bit. Let's just get to know you a little bit better. All right, cool. Let's just, let's just start surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, your wife's like, all right, that's cool with me. She'll go out there and mow the lawn. So let's start out with your testimony. Tell everybody a little bit about your life before and after meeting Jesus. Yeah. So I was born in Hyderabad, India, which is in the South. And I grew up in a kind of Christian home, going to school, uh, Sunday school on Sundays. And we would do this thing called a vacation Bible school in the holidays. And uh, you go there for a week at a time, you know, and you're learning things and being part of drama and all that kind of stuff. And so I grew up around uh, churchy things. And uh, my family migrated to New Zealand when I was 11 years old. So my mom, my dad, two older sisters, we all came here. And it was a big culture shock uh, for them, not just me, but because I was the youngest guy, it was easy for me to learn the ways, but it was hard for my family. So during that time, they were making sense of the shift. And I've heard now that migration is like trauma, man. It's In a way, it's trauma because you're leaving everything behind. You're coming to a new space. And so my mom, who was very qualified, kept getting told she's too qualified for a job. Like, you're overqualified. What is that? And my dad was like, okay, I've got to take any job I can get. And so I watched them really push hard to give me and my sisters a, a footing platform. But during that time, for me, I just drifted in my heart from people. It became this thing of, I've got to protect myself. I've got to look out for myself. They, they, this whole self-reliance thing started to be birthed in me. And... Um, Slowly, I stopped going to church things because I didn't believe God was really real. It was just religious to me at that time. And yeah, about 18, 19, I'm in university. I start partying. I start clubbing, uh, drinking, and it's all going awesome <laughs> for about three or four years. And um, probably in the third or fourth year of this intense kind of party life that's slowly booming, I get invited to a Pentecostal church. And... I only went to make that guy happy because he invited me so many times. So I went there and I still remember walking in this room and the lights were dim and there were people on a stage and they're all dancing. Everyone's dancing and they're all happy. And I was like, this looks just like the club I went to last night. Like, this is not church. And then I go closer and, and these guys were worshiping like their eyes, like they look blazed, like they're so happy. And they're like, they look blazed. Like I'm like, you're on something. And uh, anyway, the worship finished and then the pastor's preaching and then he's like laying hands on some people and they're falling out. And I was like, this cannot be real. This is not church, like the way I've known. So he says- What, what religion were you raised in? Was it Catholic or what was it? It would have been like Anglican, Presbyterian kind of thing, you know? Okay, keep so, going. So there were robes and like the, the altar boy and that kind of thing, you know, <laughs> organ. And raised, I don't know if raised is the right word. Like to me, it was just tradition. It had nothing to do with God, really. It was just what we did. Mm -hmm. And but my grandma was a woman of faith. And now when I look back, I can see like now she walked with God. So when I go in this church and I see this, I'm like, this can't be real. How can they be so happy? Is this God? What is it? And then he's praying for people. They're falling out under the power of God. And I'm like, I need to test this. And then he says, if you want to know if this is real, come forward. So I'm getting ready to go. And the guy who drove me to the church, my friend, he flips out. He's like, we need to go. We need to go. We got to go. And I was like, let's do this thing. He's like, we need to go. And kind of, he's my ride. So I had to leave. And I never understood till years later why this guy flipped out. Like something in him was getting worried, you know, like a spirit. Was he possessed? Or something. Was he yeah, possessed? like I think he was manifesting something huh. because it was really weird how that happened. So... We leave, and during that time, in the next six weeks, my partying, everything gets worse. Uh, my opportunities to do dumb things increase. So I'm getting favor from the wrong side to, to you know, do things, like all kinds of craziness. And uh, for some reason, June 8th, 2008, I end up at this church again. And this time, no one came with me. I drove. I was still drunk from the night before. I drive in, I go sit in the back seat. And I'm like having an argument with myself. Like, what, what are you doing? Why are you here? And as this girl is singing, she starts singing in tongues. And as she's singing, I feel a heat go through my body and I sober up. And I freaked out. There was no one near me, nobody touching me, nothing. And so I was like, what's going on? Uh, my eyes are closed and I start seeing my childhood, VBS, vacation Bible school, my Sunday school. And God just showed me he was with me the whole way. 
And I'm weeping because I'm like, oh my gosh, like you're real? You're really real? And then I got a bit angry because I was like, why didn't anybody show me you were real? Like, all these years of, you know, stupidity. I wouldn't have done half this stuff if I knew you were real. And then I made a challenge to him. I said, if you're really real, and it sounds so funny to me now, but at that time, even though he showed himself to me, I wasn't ready to, to do anything about it. And I was like, if you're really real, show me, I'll give you 30 days. And if you show me, then you can have me, you can have my life. So in those 30 days, I went to every church service. I saw people getting healed of stuff and cancer getting healed and demons getting cast out. I'm having all these encounters with God. And somewhere in those 30 days, man, I just was all in. And that kind of began my journey of reckless abandonment. Let's call it that. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. It's funny. It was when I got saved, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 27 years old. And I remember thinking, basically, you're like, you're real. I remember thinking like, wow, you don't just die because I didn't. Up until then, I guess I wondered if God was real, but I guess I'd started to believe evolution at the time or whatever. But I remember thinking to myself, like, it's crazy to believe that's, or not to believe, but it's true. It's crazy to think that someone could go through their entire life and never know. It's like you live, you were living in the matrix and you didn't even know it. Isn't that wild? Like to me, that is the craziest thing. And God allows it for some people. Some people go through their whole life and they never know. I'm like, that is unbelievable. Yeah. We get to open the door, you know? Did you feel like a, cause what happened to me is I, and I was crazy. I wouldn't, mm. have, I wouldn't imagine that I had a fear of death. Cause the way I used to party, I would drive high all the time. I would just do mm. crazy stuff. Like I wasn't scared of death, mm. but I remember when I got baptized in the spirit, this fear of death that was on me that I didn't even know was on me lifted off uh, mm. where I was like, you don't just die. I didn't even know that I had this fear of death, but I think every human being must have it. And even if you're unaware of it, you have this fear. I think that's what partly why I partied so hard because I was like, I'm going to die one day. Yeah, so yeah. I got to get it in. I got to do it now because I won't be, I won't be around one day to enjoy anything. Mm. Did you feel that fear of death? Yeah, I had that YOLO thing before it became YOLO. Like that was my thing. Like you only live once, just right. do it. That's how I made my decisions. Same. So I get you, man. And the bigger thing for me happened when I came out of that building that day, it felt like everything became high definition for me. And suddenly like the clouds, the, the leaves, this sounds really weird, but it all became real. And when I look back, I look at my old life and I'm like, who was that guy? There were things I did that I'm like, I can't believe I said that. I did that. I walked that path. It was like I was blind. Like I woke up literally, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Rob Kowalski here. When I first got serious about living intentionally and becoming a better version of myself, I found a major shortage of things to do and people to do them with. And it was the loneliness and boredom that led me to starting CityFam. So I just want to take a moment right now and encourage you to go over and join the CityFam Facebook community. It's a free Facebook group and in it you'll find purpose-driven people from all over the world that want to enjoy life to the fullest. You can search it on Facebook or you can go to www.friendswithbetterbenefits.com and it'll take you right there. While I'm mentioning it, if you're single, searching for real love, love before sex, as I like to say, I wanna encourage you to join the Waiting Works community. That's another free Facebook group I put together designed to help people wait well, date well, and ultimately hit the mark in life and love. And you can go to www.reallovewaits.com and I'll see you over there. Now back to the episode. So let's talk about what you're doing now. So what is like, how do you, how did you land on this of helping people find their purpose and then being, become the person that could actually attain it? Like, how did you get there? What was the journey like? Yeah. So when this happened, I plugged into my church and I'm like, I'm going all in so much. So my family was scared for me. And they're like, this guy, he's become all about church and Jesus, is he okay? What's wrong? So I'm like at a Monday night prayer meeting. I'm at Wednesday night home group. I'm at Thursday worship practice. I'm at Friday youth, youth leader, youth pastor. And I'm at Sunday two church services. I was all in. And to me, I was like, oh, look, we understand God is real. Like we were seeing miracles, signs, wonders, gemstones falling in worship, angelic feathers, gold dust. Like it was mind boggling. Oh, and you, you know? saw the gold dust? Yeah, all of this was happening in our church pretty regularly. You wow, know? dude, I've seen we videos were, on that. I see all the gold teeth. And I wasn't sure if it was real. Did that actually happen? Totally. Gold teeth, I've not seen manifest, but I've met many people who've had their teeth turn into oh. full gold. And even when you see it, you're like, mm, your brain is... Wow. Uh, but, but gold dust, like showers of gold dust, pockets of gold dust pop in. 
You know, I had it all up in my hair in one meeting. We saw it. It, it would appear on people who were getting healed. Wow, you guys got to Google that. Google the gold God gave me gold teeth or gold dust. I saw it and I wasn't sure. I was like, is this real? And then now hearing it from somebody that actually experienced it, that's crazy. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. These things make you, it's a sign that makes you wonder. And that's what they're there for. They're like a billboard, something that God's doing, just make you go, is there something else here? You know? <laughs> I remember seeing my first miracle of a guy's leg growing out and it grew, grew out about four inches and my eyes, I was shocked. My brain short circuited. I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know how to react. And that kind of opened a new way of thinking for me. So these miracle signs and wonders are awesome. And so that was going on in my church. I, as that was going on, I think about, we read about the miracles in, in the Bible all the time. What were the people like that back then? What were they thinking? Cause they see somebody come back from the dead. Jesus raises somebody and they're like, what the heck walking on water or whatever. So why is it, why is it more like any more weird to us now that it would happen? Because you know? somewhere we made this about, oh, there's a book about stories. This has nothing to do with my everyday life. Yeah. Like I can tell you, if I didn't see these supernatural things, I wouldn't be how I am for God now. Like I crossed the line, man. I'm ready to die for this thing. Like it's so real. I remember crossing that line, but if I'd never seen the reality, because I think deep down, we all know we're a spirit being. We're not just a body. We have a spirit, we have a soul and a body. So we're longing for that fullness, every person, you know? And that's why I think people get into psychics and, and mediums and they, they get into that realm because deep down, we were created supernaturally to be supernatural, you know? Yeah. So as this is going on in our church, like we'd have druggies come and we'd have people that were ex-prostitutes, they'd get deliverances. Like, so I'm seeing the demons, you know? I remember this one meeting, these, um, and this was crazy. So I'm sitting in, in like the third or fourth row and the girl in front of me swearing during uh, the preaching. She just suddenly is just like, F them, F them, F them. And everyone's like, whoa, what's going on? And so she starts manifesting this thing. So they take her to another room just to deliver her. And then after five minutes, on the other side of the room, another lady starts to, rrr, rrr, rrr. and these are just people who were invited for a meeting, you know, like they're a guest and they don't even know what's in them. Anyway, these two demons start screaming to each other. And that day was a big deal for me because one of them screamed to the other, hold on, they can't get us. And I'm like, what the, like, how real is this wow. realm? <laughs> wow, that's creepy, but man. It's very, man. It's very creepy until you start understanding the spirit realm. And so all of that started to happen. And my pastor would be like, lay hands on the sick. They'll recover. So I started practicing. I used to be a door-to-door -door salesman. So I was selling cable TV. And if I saw someone sick, I'd lay hands on them or I'd, I'd speak to them about God. And I saw many people come to the Lord and get healed and get delivered. You know, I cast demons out of a guy in his front yard once, which was a crazy story. And his family were freaking out watching from the window. But it was so real for him because then he encountered God and he had this amazing experience with Holy Spirit in his front yard. So that kind of stuff started happening in my life. And I was big on discipleship. So if anybody came to the Lord, I would plug in with them. We would do life together, like watch sport together, play sport together, play some video games. I started playing games that other guys liked just to, to, to build that connection. They'd come to my house. I'd go to their house. All of that was going on. And then there was an affair that kind of happened in our church. It blew everything open, you know? And so for me, all my paradigms started getting shattered because I was like, we have the supernatural. How can this happen here? And God started to show me that character and gifting are two different things. So was, it, was, was it the pastor? Yeah, it was, it was in the And he was actually casting de demons out and healing people. And he still was, and he still had secret. Here's the thing that people need to understand. Your gifting is from God. The Bible says the giftings of God and the calling is irrevocable. He doesn't take it back. Wow. You know, wow. but your character, your real maturity is always going to be on you. And wow. that is you, pretty much your character, your wow. response. Yeah. So you could do all this stuff. And so in the Pentecostal world, we value people that have the gifting but we don't understand that the gifting is God manifesting through them. Right. But what is their response to that? Oh. So I started to see all the stuff that blew my mind and it shook me because they say when you see your hero fall or your hero do something, and he was a hero to me. So it wrecked some of my paradigms at that time. So I go through the season and during that time, it was like I got thrown into a washing machine dry cycle because when this happened, a lot of people came to me to ask me what I think and, um, what am I doing? And they said they trusted me 
in a way, a little bit more than any of the leadership because I was living with them. The leadership didn't necessarily do life. They did authority and counsel and advice, but not life. So I went through a whole craziness and maybe that's another podcast, but eventually I came to this point of what is the point of this? And it began this frustration in me of, okay, we see signs, miracles, wonders. Okay, I'm going to lead people to you. But then what? What is the point? And I started to understand kingdom and how Jesus actually didn't bring Christianity. He didn't bring churchianity. He actually brought a kingdom. And that everybody has a kingdom assignment, a kingdom purpose. That our goal wasn't just to go to church on a Sunday or to go to home group on a Wednesday. That my whole life had purpose in the kingdom. My marriage, my children, my work, my vocation, my career, my business, whatever it is, everything has purpose in the kingdom. So that started to lead me into, well, God, what what have you equipped me for? What have you called me for? One of my fears was my speaking ability, my speaking. I knew I had it and I knew I had it as a kid. But when I met God or encountered God, I felt like I can't use this gift outside of church. Like I have to be an evangelist. If I do anything other than being an evangelist, I'm prostituting my gift because that was my conditioning at that time. I didn't understand kingdom. I didn't understand what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. I didn't understand all of this stuff. So God started to open that up to me and speak to me about speaking and going online and coaching and different things, patterns of my life showing me how they all have to do with why he created me like this. And uh, so I began that journey. I started a podcast. I wrote a book. I started coaching groups. I've started to walk with a whole bunch of people. So the last four years has been a massive exponential growth of that, of all of the things that were in me. So even though now I'm coaching people on purpose, I'm moving into my cycles of purpose. And I've watched a lot of people start to uh, move in the right direction towards what they were created to be and do on this planet. Yeah. So since we talked the last time, I've been watching more of Miles Monroe stuff. Because I'm really trying to get a grasp of this kingdom thing, man. And I don't know that I fully understand it now. So what is the difference between kingdom and purpose? Is there a difference? Because I feel like I'm walking in my purpose now. And I had Daniel Lappin, Rabbi Daniel Lappin on a few episodes ago. And we were talking about Exodus, the story of when God delivered the Jews Egypt. And mm-hmm. how that story parallels so much of what God does in our life. Because he gets us out of slavery, of sin. Then he gets the sin out of us. First, he saves us, and then he gets the sin out. He sanctifies us. Then he takes us into our promised land where he shows us the real purpose for our life, not to make bricks. Mm -hmm. And then we actually walk in that purpose and we achieve fulfillment. Is that kingdom or is there some difference? Yeah. So you can't separate the two, right? The way I would say it is you understand your purpose in the kingdom. So Jesus coming, bringing bringing this new way of life. He starts saying things like, it's no longer just that you looked at a woman and you didn't actually physically touch her, so you're fine. Now it is in your heart, you already committed adultery, right? He's bringing the way this other kingdom operates. In this other kingdom, you don't get stoned. There is forgiveness. There is healing. There's restoration. In this other kingdom, even though you deserve a punishment, I am going to take your punishment, so now you won't get that punishment. There is grace and mercy, right? In this other kingdom, it's all about becoming love. You don't judge people, right? When someone uh, slaps you on one side, you turn your other cheek. Like, it's not because you're weak. It's because you understand reality that you see the bigger picture. And in Jesus's life, like he's getting whipped. He's getting uh, crucified. And he's, I could call down legions of angels right now, but I'm from another kingdom. My kingdom operates differently. And you were actually created for that kingdom, not for this earthly way of life. So we have to go back to Genesis and creation to see the original intent of man. A lot of what we look at life is not our original intent. And so when you come to God and you start understanding the kingdom, you start to look at life and the world from his perspective instead of what you've just been taught. And so it goes much deeper. So the way I would, if if I was to go to the same example that Rabbi used, then I would say, yep, yep, yep. Except now when you come into your promised land, How do you know how to build? Because if you still think like a slave, you don't even know how to build. So in that journey from being a slave to now coming into your promised land in that wilderness, what actually happens is you stop thinking like a slave and you start thinking like a land owner. You stop thinking like one who's under, who just does a nine to five. And you start thinking as one who builds cities, one who creates Because that was our original intent. When Adam was made, he was made to have dominion. It's like uh, the Bible says the heavens of the heavens belong to the Lord, but earth is given to man. 
So it's almost like the earth was Adam's nursery. Like I built a nursery for my baby before she came. The nursery was ready. Once she was born, it's here you go. This is yours. I still own it, but you have rulership over it. Right. And that's what happened with Adam is God this is still mine. The earth belongs to me, but I'm giving you rulership, management, stewardship. And he says, multiply, have dominion, subdue. And he gives Adam different roles. Like you can speak to these animals, name them. What happened when Adam named the animals is he actually gave them a nature. He gave them their identity. He didn't just give them a name like, oh, hi, giraffe. He made a giraffe into what a giraffe is by naming it and giving it a name. So Adam and Eve, they were walking with God and doing life before the fall. What were they talking about? Most of us don't even know how to pray outside of something demonic they were getting rid of or a need. Like, I need this. Like, but what if there was a realm that we get to walk with God that's higher than just that? Does that make sense? Yeah, so let's talk about it. I guess what I want to do for the listeners is let's bring it down to a practical level. So everything that you're saying, how do we bring it down to what other steps that people can follow to figure out their purpose? Because then, do you think anybody's born to work a job? Anybody in the world? Are there people that are born to, that God made specifically to be an employee? What do you believe? Yeah, I would. So it's hard to answer that question with a yes or no, because when you understand kingdom purpose, then your position in a company or your position as an employee doesn't mean much. All right? it, it doesn't mean much because you're bringing influence from a different realm. You understand? So let's say that tomorrow God's showing me I need to go be a janitor at the a big law firm. And I go in there, I spiritually, I still have the same authority. And so I could end up as a janitor and now I'm influencing the CEO and I'm changing that whole company. And no one in this planet knows, but all of heaven knows because my assignment is a kingdom assignment. It's not an earthly assignment. I don't need to be recognized here. And that, that's what I mean by the perspective shift has to come from, oh, I'm a child of God. God has divinely designed me to be here at this time. Yeah. I am completely equipped for something, some things. And as I explore them and I mature, he opens up new realms for me to govern. Now, some of this language might seem a bit funny, but it is as simple as I have three daughters upstairs. They're six, three, and one. And as we do life together, they start to grow into who they were always supposed to be. And I start to trust them with things more because they can handle the things. So for example, I could buy a car right now for my six-year-old. She can't even reach the pedals. She doesn't understand what a license is. There's no way she's qualifying for any of that. Yeah, and if I gave her the car, she would hurt herself and hurt someone else. So if you, if you come back to that kind of thinking, then your father in heaven is walking this journey with Rob. And he's like, here, Rob, you're maturing. You're becoming more and more like how I created you to be, which is just like him. You love like him. You live like him. You care for people like him. You walk the earth like him. You solve problems like him. Even when someone hates you, you don't hate them back because you love like God, like your father. And as you're growing in there, God's like, okay, now I'm going to open this up, Rob. Rob, we're going to do this now. We're going to move into this now. And then you start to mature into the fullness of your purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I think, I think so. so. So let me tell you practically what that could be like. So practically, just practical sense. You look at David, okay? David in the Bible is uh, Jesse's son. He's actually an illegitimate son. That's why he's left on the outside. And Jesse, uh, David is looking after Jesse's sheep. So he's looking after the sheep and he's playing the harp. And it looks like something that doesn't even matter. Like you're just a little shepherd boy in the corner. All the other brothers, they're training to be warriors. But look at you, just a shepherd boy. But while he's doing his assignment, he's enjoying God. And he's just being faithful in, in his life, wherever he is with God. Then a bear shows up. And when this bear shows up, David now has two choices. I'm going to step in the gap and try and protect this sheep. Or I'm going to run. <laughs> I'm going to take a sheep and run, you know. But he chooses to step in the gap, which is revealing what? It's revealing his maturity. He's yeah. just like Jesus. Because Jesus stepped in the gap for Rob and Rob's sin. For Joseph and Joseph's sin. Now David is stepping in the gap between the sheep and the bear. He kills the bear, protects the sheep. And now he would understand, oh man, like... I walk with God. His identity just shot through the roof. Do you know what I mean? Like the first time you go out into the world and you lead someone to the Lord or you see a miracle or something, like that, your understanding of you and God increases. So now David has his increase and now a lion comes. He does the same thing with the lion. But what's happening is he's maturing to handle the next assignment. 
So practically what this looks like is if whoever's listening to me, if you start engaging God, and what I mean by that is just praying and listening to what you're doing and you start becoming faithful there, there will be an increase that comes next because you're maturing. But most people, they separate what they're doing from God. Like they try and do things for God. They're not doing things with God. You understand? Like my children aren't living their life for me. They're living their life with me. Right. Me and my wife brought them into this world. We gave them life in a way, but they're living their life with me. So as we start to realize we're doing life with God, this purpose just starts to increase. Like It's like you go from assignment to assignment and you're fulfilling your life's ultimate purpose as you just walk through these assignments. Yeah. As you're talking, it just seems like incredibly motivating to mature because you're not going to get him give you more if you're not growing and you're not maturing you know we we were all created to mature that is your original intent that's why nobody stays a baby you know we were looking at my one and a half year old last night i'm like i wish she could stay at this phase forever she's so cute so cute in their baby phase but she was created to mature to grow so were you so was i so where people are not growing there is a frustration within themselves Everyone feels it, whether Jesus or not, everyone feels it. That's why you have midlife crisis. Because suddenly you're like, I'm here for something. What is it? Oh, let me try and do this. Let me try and do that. That's why I believe as you get older, you sleep less. Most old people that I know, they sleep less. They sleep six hours. But it's all okay. My time, I'm conscious of my time on this planet. I have something to leave here to deposit, to do before I leave. You know? Yeah, probably a lot of hormonals there too. I would imagine there's some biology. Sure. Behind it, but sure. So what is the most common myth or misconception in, regard, in regards to life purpose that you come across? There, there are a few. One of them, just before we go into that, like this hormonal thing, totally. There's a spirit, a soul, and a body. So the hormonal thing is our body existence, but we have a soul existence too. And so when I'm talking about somewhere deep inside, we know we are here for something. Every person is asking their question, whether they publicly say it or not. And if you oh, get yeah. a few people on some tokes, it starts to come out. You know, like, why am I here? So anyway, so the spirit, soul, body, the three realms matter. Um, when you come back here to the misconceptions, the common one is that my purpose is on the outside. I have to go find it. So people go on overseas experiences, they go on um, these kind of retreats, and they're looking for their purpose somewhere out there instead of realizing it's actually inside me, it's always been in me, and it's in a seed form, and I need to nurture that seed into a tree. Mm, That's so good, man. When I started meeting with my first coach, Lori Lockamy, 10 or 11 years ago, she asked me a bunch of questions and all the different priority areas in my life. And I answered them. And that, that was really how I landed on it originally was a, a, she wrote a vision statement based off my answers, but you're right. Cause I remember I'd started this marketing company about 10 years ago and I was doing it and it was moderately successful. I was making some money and my business, I had a business partner and I remember I said to him, I'm like, dude, I don't care if we signed up Coca-Cola. I'm like, it wouldn't make me happy. He goes, what do you want to do? And when he asked me, I just, it just came out. I said, I want to lead people to Jesus through social events. Uh I just just blurted it out. You just got to get somebody like the right coach, ask you the question. So let's talk about the way you coach people. How are you getting them to, to, to land on it? How are you getting it to come out? Do you ask questions or what, how do you do it? Yeah, I think questions are very important. And I train all the people I work with to ask questions because questions cause people to go deeper and bring answers and bring a shit. A question is the most powerful thing we can do. So I love that. And I love that they asked you that question, which is great. When I look at your life, I can see a lot of the training that I do. I talk about how uh, there are different elements to launch you like a rocket. And one of the elements is your life's training. So when you look at Rob's life, he did social events. He knew how to deal with people. He knew how to gather people. He knew how to make an event, make it a thing. He knew how to run this like an administration, so to speak. And he was doing it, just doing it without intention. And now he comes to the Lord and the purpose and the intention is the same gifting, same life's training, but he's now using it in the light. And I've seen this over and over again. That's one of the ways you can know what God's called you to do is by looking at your life's training. I was always a coach. I was always giving coaching on some capacity. I was always the captain of a sports team. People were always coming to me for advice in some form or the other. I just never realized. So that's one of the things I do is get people to look at their life's training. Let's look back. What have you done? What have you been involved in? What was good? What was bad? What was ugly? 
because all of that matters. God is going to use, I have this guy um, who's from a Middle Eastern country and he's in a country where they get persecuted uh, for being a believer. But this guy used to deal ecstasy and he used to deal drugs as a 17 year old in America. He was uh, underground rave scene, burner phones, hacking into firewalls, getting away from the police. He was into all of that. Comes to God, now he's in a Middle Eastern nation. He's doing the same thing, but he's running underground conferences, underground churches, burner phones, hacking firewalls. <laughs> it's all that's the same cool. thing. That's And that's what's so awesome about God is because it's like, it's so much more gratifying when you're using those gifts. Like when I used to pack a club, it was fun and it was, I made money, but it's nothing like as gratifying when you lead somebody to the Lord using mm -hmm. your gifts because that's eternal. You're like, dude, one day we're going to be in heaven together forever. Like how much more rewarding is that? And I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Like I was, I just had some weird thought the other day where I was thinking about Jesus and I was like, was it possible for Jesus to fail? Like when he came to earth, could he have sinned? Yeah, I believe it was. He could have sinned and everything, we would have all been screwed. The reason why I believe it was possible, because it's like God to allow that. Because if it wasn't possible for Jesus to fail, it wouldn't have been as gratifying for him when he didn't fail. Because mm -hmm. now he's, you got to imagine that Jesus is pretty gratified. Like he's sitting at the right hand of the throne. He's, and he yeah. gets to see all of these lives that change because of him and how gratifying that must be for him. Mm -hmm. because it would have been it was possible for him maybe to not succeed so i don't and know I have that was his thoughts. purpose yeah, yeah man i i get what you're saying and that was his ultimate purpose and we know that because before he finished he said it is finished yeah before he goes he's it is done what is it the reason i came my purpose it is finished you know yeah. so is passion and purpose the same thing yeah and then this is a good question because a lot of times we get obsessed about passion. A lot of people talk about passion, but really the, the root word, the Latin word for passion is actually sacrifice. And it's actually, passion is not my lusty, I feel good, I'm lustful for this. Like it makes me feel sensual, what we've turned it into. It's actually the passion of the Christ. What is that? The sacrifice. It is, it's I'm willing to go all in. So our definition of passion is very shallow. Most people look at passion like, oh, what do I enjoy? What do I like? Right. Not, they don't go deep enough into what am I going to die for? Right. You know, so passion does have to do with purpose, but I believe you mature into that. And that's the thing I'm trying to get people to understand. This is not a journey of God's out there and he's like a headmaster and I'm a student or an orphan and I'm trying my best to please him. This is actually, he's my dad. I'm his child and he is raising me, which means he's stacking all the chips in my favor, which means he's doing everything he knows to raise me as a son. So if we take that into account, then God is trying to mature us in all of it. And so your passion, the thing that you love, if you let that go deep enough to where you love it so much, you will let your life down for it. You're now coming into a deeper understanding of purpose. Awesome. So what Enneagram type are you? Do you know? Have you ever taken that test? Uh, yeah, I did a while ago. I don't remember it. I did another personality test with the ENFJ. Are those ones? The four letters? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's what yeah that one but here's the thing i say about personality tests that's just a reflection of where i am today a personality test can never define me god's already defined me and so this personality test is a reflection of my current experience so for example i was reading some questions in there and i was like if i did this five years ago i would answer this completely differently and so it's a great feedback form it's a great gauge but it can't define my identity because I've already been defined in Jesus. That's something I try and tell people. When you look at a personality test, bring it into good context. Don't look at it as your defining moment. It's just showing you where you're at now. Yeah. I was on your landing page for your challenge. And I was looking at some of your success stories. And I was like seeing the people wrote books or they launched coaching programs, made money. What is it? What is the biggest like obstacle holding people back from stepping into their purposes is fear and, of failing and the fear actually is not even a failing because when you start going into root causes and i say okay why do you fear failing oh because i people are going to think i'm stupid but why does that matter it was because then they're not going to value me why does that matter then i might not have people that want me why does that matter and you start to realize that deep down the real fear is i don't know if god really loves me wow and you will always catch that. Yeah. People that are single, people that don't have kids yet, people that want the business breakthrough, want to whatever breakthrough deep down, the real cause is, do I trust that God loves me enough that he will make this come to pass? 
Or wow. do I have to make it happen? And if I have to make it happen, I'm going to reach. And how am I going to reach? I'm going to grab that fruit and I'm going to eat it. And then with my knowledge of good and evil, I'm going to take action. Mm. You know, but the tree of life sets us free from that. Wow. And that's interesting. But like, I wonder if I have any of that down there, like fear of, does God love me? Because I, I get, I think back to Adam and Eve and the first sin really was, so we didn't trust God. Adam and Eve thought God was holding that the devil got in their head and said, oh, he really, he's, he, he knows you'll be like him. And they were like, huh, they had this uh, trust issue. Yeah. And I, and I feel like that is the one thing that we can withhold from God is trust because we can't give God anything. Like we, what are yeah. we going to give him money? He has everything. He doesn't need That's our fine. money. He created everything. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we can withhold from him is our trust. Yeah. So that's why this journey of faith is so important. That's why it's impossible to please him without. Faith. So the way I would say it is like my six-year-old trusts me more than my one and a half year old, because my six-year-old has had more moments where she's had to trust me. She's seen more life where she's had to trust me. She's seen more things. So for example, if I get my daughter to jump off a curb and the curb is this big and she's not sure, Oh, I don't know if I can do it. And what if I slip? The real fear is, will Papa catch me? Can Papa protect me? And then she jumps and she slips and I grab her. Now she's like, Dad protected me. But when we go to her next jump, it happens all over again. Because now she's he protected me there, but this is higher. He really protect me. Boom, I protect her. And then now the next jump. And that's why these assignments, they start small and get bigger and bigger. Because at every jump, you learn to trust him. I've had to do that in the last two months. I've had to face my, my heart of... Man, do I really believe? I know last year you came through. I know you were walking with, I know this is, but now this is bigger. This is bigger, God. Like really? And the only way you're going to know is by jumping, man. This is, I say that all the time. And I think that's why it's so important to pursue your purpose because it's the way your faith grows. Because when you are working a job and you got a paycheck, how much faith do you really need? You don't need sure. a lot of faith. Now, mm -hmm. God might put you in some situations where you need faith. Somebody get, you might get sick or a lot of things could happen where you, to grow your faith. But when you're walking in your purpose and you don't have a steady income, that mm -hmm. is a whole different level of faith. Yeah. I know in my own life, I didn't, not only did I have not have money, I just wasn't smart enough to do the things I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. was, I didn't have enough of anything. So mm -hmm. it really grew my faith, but it's not fun, man. It's, I used to say walking on water hurts your feet. Like it's not because you're always like, oh sh shit, like how's this going to work out? And you're like, yeah. You're always like uncertain and it, yeah. but it, it, the word says it's your faith is worth more than gold. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, there's nothing really more valuable to him than that trust that you have. And I, I believe it's because I guess because our character is the thing that we're going to take into eternity. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be something directly related to how much we're able to trust him, maybe with how much we're entrusted to rule over and reign or whatever. I don't know yeah. exactly. But yep. there is something I believe that faith is going to be valuable in the afterlife. Yeah. Totally, man. Totally agree. And the walking on water thing, he's trying to get us to move from just walking on water to walking on his words. In that story, Peter walked on water, but actually he walked on the words of Jesus. Because he says, if that's you, bid me to come. Call me and I'll walk. I'm not just walking on water. I'm walking on what you've told me. And so there is something about that. So now you can see that people can go to church their whole life and never engage an assignment and never actually trust God. And that's why most believers, they go up and down instead of maturing from growth to growth, because they never put themselves in a moment where they needed God to show. And your assignment is designed to do that. If you're going to write a book and you've never written a book, you're going to have all kinds of fears come up, man. Who's going to read this thing? Why would someone care about me? What am I even going to write? I don't even have good grammar. All that kind of stuff. And in those moments, you're choosing to walk on the water or walk on his words. And when the book comes out and someone reads it and they go, wow, that's amazing. Suddenly you're like, wow, like, and you're ready for your next. Dude, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because I know the hardest I ever prayed when I was writing my book, I'm not a great writer. And I followed the advice of a writing coach and I put, I made a cover for the book and I pre-sold copies before it was written. And wow. a couple, I sold like 20 copies. So my back was against the wall where I was like, crap, I, I got to write it. And man, I've never prayed so hard. I was like, I was standing on that one verse that says, anyone who trusts in you will never be put to shame. 
And I just prayed that. And he, and God delivered, man. He sent me the right people that could edit. And it just came together. Now it got over 100 five star reviews on Amazon. But God wrote that book. I tell people all the time, I'm like, God wrote that because I, I would never have been able to do it without him. Bro, but that's such a great story, man, because you just walked on his word. So you remember the words that yeah. you walked on. Mm -hmm. He will not put you to shame. So yeah. everyone has their own words. And this is the thing about union. So when we say you got to trust God, you got to have faith. Like I trust my wife. I've done 11 years of life with my wife. I've been through three pregnancies with her. I've watched her deliver. Like the first baby we had. And when I watched the process and the blood and what she went through, my respect level for her, like it blew my mind. But it also brought us like, ah. And that's the thing with God. Most people don't do life with him like that. They don't bring him into these situations. They don't bring him into their fears, their worries, their anxieties. Like some people I've coached, I've had to tell them, listen, your heart is saying that you don't trust God, but with your mouth, you're trying to sing like you trust him. Stop lying. Right. He can hear your heart. Just tell him the truth and you can start moving, you know? But a lot of people are scared to tell God, like, I don't believe you're going to show up for me as if he's going to have an identity crisis or something, you know? Right. Like, and, and that's where I think doing life will breed that trust very organically talk about the challenge i know you're getting ready to, or did you already launch it or are you getting ready to launch it next wednesday so next one wednesday. week from now yeah okay so actually yeah two days from now because this is monday <laughs> night <laughs> so the challenge launches this wednesday right two days well it'll be wednesday new zealand time so tuesday american time okay, just all to right, so basically <laughs> tomorrow guys tomorrow the challenge <laughs> launches and tell us about it how are you helping people specifically before you tell us about the whole thing how are you helping people through the challenge overcome that fear? If that's yeah, the biggest so, thing, I'm curious to that. Yeah, I like to work on identity first, principle second. I think that when you live by principles, you're only as good as your last principle. When you live by identity, you can never be shaken. If my daughter thinks that she's in my house because of her behavior, she's only as good as her last behavior. So anytime she messes up, she's going to think she's done and she's going to run out of the house. But if she knows that even if she broke the most expensive thing in my house, that my relationship with her will never change. She now has a freedom to live with me that just transcends everything. So that's the first thing I do is bring people into the freedom of their identity. You need to know that you're as son as son can be. There is no kicking you out. You're not losing your place. You're not getting booted out if you don't save a thousand people or a thousand souls or anything like that. This is you and your dad going on an adventure. And so when I say that, people go, that sounds amazing. It's so freeing. But but I don't believe it. And then I'm like, let's find your curb. We got to find your curb. For some people, their curb is writing a book. For some people, their curb is doing a live video. Like I get people to do live videos in our group because I'm like, when you do that live video, you're going to come face to face with you. And it might be the first time you've ever done that. So let's take that first step. Jump off the curb. Jump off your next curb. What's your next curb? So for some people I've coached, it's been their third business, you know, or second business. And for some people, it's their first book. For some people, it's their first video. I get them to jump off the curb with the knowing of their identity, and then we do it again, and then we do it again, and then we do it again. And before that, they've changed. And six months later, they look back and go, what just happened? Like a year later, I can't believe I just did that. And two years later, oh my gosh, I'm getting ready for this. And that's how I do it. Simple. Start simple. How do people register? I am josephwilson.com forward slash pop challenge. So I can send you that link. And yeah. you just click that link, register. It's, it's free. Um, it will go for five days, probably a little bit more because I'll, I'm going to get some guests in there. And um, I will guarantee you at the end of those five days, you will have more clarity and a better understanding of your lane. That's my goal. Is that even if you do just a five-day experience with me, you need to have your next curb, jump of your next curb. You need to know your next step. And that's what I will make sure you get at the end of those five days. Love it. I'm going to put that in the show notes. I'll also drop it in the comments for everybody. I am josephwilson.com. Is there a forward slash or no? Yeah. Forward slash pop challenge. Okay. Awesome. Pop challenge. Yeah. Pop open into your purpose. Love it. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to, for people to connect with you on social media? Is it, what's your favorite platform? Well, whichever works that Facebook is the main one. Instagram's also there. So if okay. you go into iamjosephwilson.com, there's a link tree and they can just connect there with me. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, everybody go follow Joseph, register for his challenge. Super important, guys, that you get this, especially, you know, I got a lot of people that are, are waiting uh, that follow me that are basically trying to find love before sex is what I like to say. And mm. it's so much easier to do this when your purpose.
because the yeah. first six years I was a, a believer, I did not know what I was here to do. And it was horrible. It, it's never easy, but when you know what you're shooting for, that your ideal life, you have a clear picture of it and, and your place in the world, it's just so much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. People say find your purpose before your person or your work before your woman, your mission before your man. And I think like, some people don't like that. But for me, that, that was a big part because when I found my purpose in the sense that I was going to walk with God, then all these other things fell into play. Right. This quote up here, it says, when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. Hmm. Right? So that means that when you don't know the purpose of something, you will abuse it. Abuse is not just sexual abuse or drug abuse like we think. Abuse is just abnormal use. You're using this thing abnormally. You're not using it for what it was meant to be. So marriage has a purpose. Children have a purpose. Fathering, mothering has a purpose. Your life has a purpose. Your body has a purpose. Everything, when you bring it into alignment of purpose, the kingdom purpose, God's purpose, it becomes easy. You can do it from the rest is a massive principle in the Bible that many people have not mastered. This, these days, it's all about the hustle, you know, hustle and grind, hustle. It's exactly opposite to rest. Rest is where you know who you are and so much that you just do all this stuff and you can do things that no one else can do. And Jesus demonstrated that in three and a half years, he did so much. You can't even write it in all the books, but Jesus wasn't striving and he wasn't hustling. He was a total rest. He's, he was, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is rest. And so I believe that rest is the most powerful energy source that's ever existed. Resting in who you are in God. And so when you start thinking purpose, you start thinking rest. And it's going to bring this alignment where things happen effortlessly. Most of the effort that we put in the world that we're trying to do is from the curse. It's from Genesis 3. The ground was cursed. The way we work was cursed. But you've been redeemed from that curse. So you don't have to live like that anymore. So my neighbor might have to work 40 hours a week to survive. I don't. I don't. I'm redeemed from that. And he can be redeemed too if he wants. As you start understanding your identity, you and your good father in heaven, you walk this thing out, man. It's amazing what's going to open up for you. Hmm. I can't wait, man. I'm, I'm going to register for the challenge too. I'm going to go through it. So everybody awesome. make sure to do that. Follow Joseph on social media. And man, yeah, I just want to stay connected to you. I've definitely learned a lot from you already. I'm, I'm diving into all those Miles Monroe videos and yeah. I'm really trying to get a grasp of that. Cause I, I think there's a little bit of an orphan spirit that I carry where mm. I'm trying, I'm working, I'm trying to work my way to the, uh, the promised land versus mm. in the inheritance. Mm. I've heard that from a few people trying to grasp it. And I feel like uh, I need to hang out with more people like you. Yeah. It's totally a God connection, man. I know it. And, um, I saw yesterday that I, I podcasted Daniel. Uh, my friend Daniel, and you're going to Nicaragua. So I'm going to connect you guys. There is a lot more happening here. There's a, a whole collection and collaboration that's beginning with children of God in the world. And so I'm very excited for you because you're going to do things that you never knew you were going to do. Till now, Rob has done things that he knew he could do. He's yeah. about to come into a realm that he's going to go, what the heck? You know, so very excited for you, man. I received that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody go register for the challenge and I'll see you over there. Joseph, thanks again for coming on Kowalski Analysis. Thank you so much for having me. See you guys. See ya. All right, another great episode in the books. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation. Make sure to register for Joseph's challenge. I will see you in there. Really excited to just, you know, even though I know my purpose, I'm just always excited about sharpening the ax. I'm always excited about exploring and seeing what else is down there because that really is the beauty of this journey that we call life. It's like, we've never arrived. There's always more to do. And sometimes it's, you know, way bigger and better than anything that we've done prior. So check it out. Uh, I, this, he's a sharp guy. Joseph's the real deal. And um, yeah, I'm just excited to see what happens for y'all. So let's go ahead and do our giveaway. So again, we're giving away one VIP ticket to Charm City Countdown. It's $149 value. It's the biggest party in, in New Year's Eve. And we're just going to drop the word purpose in the comments. So if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, you can enter this competition to win a free VIP ticket to Charm City Countdown. New Year's Eve 2021. It's about, gosh, it's about two months away. It's actually a little less than two months away. Um, and we, it's at the BWI Hilton. It's, uh, all you can eat dinner buffets. I'm talking like raw oysters and carving stations and just really good food, uh, top shelf alcohol. We even have a cava bar if you're sober 
And uh, it's just amazing. There's about 10 different party areas. We have karaoke and we have this big cover band. We have this huge balloon drop at midnight. We have DJs. We have a time travel, uh, like this time portal that we're doing because it's a time travel, time traveler's ball theme. So it really is like Disneyland for adults. It is the, the best party of the year. People are coming in from all over the country to attend it. Check it out, charmcitycountdown.com. But if you want to enter to win a free ticket, Drop the word purpose in the comments below. We'll pick one lucky winner and announce them on the next episode. So that's it for Kowalski Analysis.